Okay, welcome everybody and happy Earth Day. Thank you for tuning in to the Moose Family Speaker Series today. We are expecting up to about 300 streaming participants online and we welcome you to use the chat. Tell us who you are and where you're streaming from. And please also use the chat to submit questions throughout today's webinar. Uh, we have turned closed captioning on. You can hide it by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, enough logistics. Uh, my name is Valerie Forbes and I'm the board chair at Freshwater, a Minnesota nonprofit working towards a vision of clean and safe water for us all. I'm also the Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Biological Sciences. Today, it's our pleasure to welcome you to the Moose Family Speaker Series on Water Resources, a lecture series named after the late Malcolm Moose, president of the University of Minnesota from 1967 to 1974. Freshwater and the College of Biological Sciences have partnered for years to bring cutting edge science on water from around the world to new audiences. Before I introduce Dr. Boxall, please join me in giving a special thank you to today's generous sponsors who propel forward critical programs for water. They include Sunleaf Naturals, creators of healthful bath, body, and home products for everyday healthy living, Phyllis and Roger Sherman, freshwater members dedicated to protecting Minnesota lakes for future generations, the Environmental Working Group, working to empower people with breakthrough research for informed choices and a healthy life and environment. The Minnesota Department of Health, using science, expert judgment, and policy to help Minnesotans make informed decisions about preventing and reducing health risks from drinking water. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, improving the environment and human health, ensuring that every Minnesotan has healthy air, lands, water, and a healthy climate. Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, working to conserve and manage Minnesota's natural resources for outdoor recreation, commercial use, and a sustainable quality of life. The Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Water Quality Certification Program, a voluntary opportunity for farmers and agricultural landowners to take the lead in implementing conservation practices that protect our water. And lastly, the Soil and Water Conservation District of Ramsey County, working toward their vision of a vibrant community where all are valued and thrive. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Alistair Boxall. Dr. Boxall is a professor in environmental science at the University of York. His research focuses on understanding emerging and future ecological and health risks posed by chemical contaminants in the natural environment. Dr. Boxall regularly advises national and international organizations on issues relating to chemical impacts on the environment, and he has published extens extensively on the topic of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Dr. Boxall was coordinator of the recent 10.3 million euro Innovative Medicines Initiative IPI project on risks of pharmaceuticals in the environment. He is also director of the new UK Center for Doctoral Training on Ecotoxicological Risk Assessment Towards Sustainable Chemical Use. Dr. Boxall. Thanks, Valerie. And Hello everyone. Um, it's great to be be here, even though it's virtual, um, and it's a, a real privilege to be talking to you this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to do in the next 35 minutes is just give you an overview uh, of some of the work that we've been doing uh, on the issue of pharmaceutical pollution uh, in rivers, um, and I'm going to come at it from a global uh, perspective. And before I start, I'd just like to um, acknowledge a few people. So John, uh, Emily and Ali, um, who are uh, either PhD students or postdocs in my group, uh, I'm going to draw on quite a lot of their work in my talk. Now we use uh, more than 2000 active pharmaceutical 
uh, ingredients uh, as a society. Uh, and I think if you go to uh, anyone's uh, bathroom cabinet, um, quite often you'll see something like this. Um, so you'll see a cabinet packed with uh, lots and lots of bottles. So that'll include things like personal care products and perfumes, um, but will also include pharmaceuticals. Um, and when we use pharmaceuticals, we don't really think about what happens to them uh, once they've done their job. So when we take a pharmaceutical, uh, we'll absorb the pharmaceutical into our body. Um, we may metabolize it in our body. Uh, hopefully it will have the effect that we want it to have uh, on our body. Uh, but ultimately what will happen um, is we'll excrete it. So we'll excrete it in our urine uh, or our feces. And when I put the talk together, I thought I'd do a bit of a back of the envelope calculation to try and work out you know, how much pharmaceutical uh, we release into the environment or release to the wastewater treatment system. So in the UK, we prescribe about 13,500 tonnes of active pharmaceutical ingredient each year. So that's what's prescribed uh, to humans. Um, of that, just under 3,000 tonnes, people don't use. So uh, this stuff will either be thrown away in the tr trash uh, or possibly returned to the pharmacist. Uh, just under 5,000 tonnes will be metabolised. So it'll be metabolised by our, our body and converted into other things. But just under 6,000 tonnes will be emitted as the parent active ingredient to the sewage system. So we'll be emitting that out into the sewage system. Um, and in the UK, what will happen is it will probably end up in a pipe like this. So this is a, a nice moody picture of one of the Victorian sewers in London. Um, it looks quite nice, but if you're in there, it probably wouldn't smell very nice. Um, but if I took a sample of that water, uh, I would find that that water would be packed with pharmaceuticals. So we'd detect a whole range of different pharmaceuticals in that water. Now in the UK, we transport that wastewater to treatment. And I think it's the same in the US. Um, and we use two types of treatment generally in the UK. Uh, one is um, a quite an engineered treatment. It's called an activated sludge plant. Uh, and then the other treatment we quite commonly use in more rural areas uh, is a system like this, which is a trickling filter. And what we have in these filters, as you can see in this photo, it's basically a circle. Uh, you have a gravel bed on that circle. And on that gravel, you have a film of bacteria and other, other organisms growing. And the idea is, is that the sewer, sewage water is sprayed over that biofilm and the biofilm will degrade the organic material uh, in the wastewater and clean it up. Uh, and ultimately what that, that will mean is we can then release the clean water out into the environment. Now the problem is these wastewater treatment systems never designed for treating things like pharmaceuticals. So what we find is that if we release pharmaceuticals into the wastewater system, what will happen is they will pass through these treatment loops and ultimately they'll end up in a river. Um, and this is one of my local rivers, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, this is the River Ouse, uh, which passes through the centre of York. Um, and this is one of the, the rivers in York that will be receiving most of what York's treated wastewater. Now, over the last few years, uh, my team and I have been looking at the levels of pharmaceutical contamination in York's river system. Um, what we've been doing is we've been going out to our two main rivers. So the first is the Ouse, which I just showed you. Uh, and then the second is the River Foss, which is a slightly smaller river. And what we've been doing is we've been going out every month uh, over a few years now. We've been taking samples at different locations along both of the river systems. Um, and you can see on this map here, we have a map of the river, uh, the red uh, areas are the wastewater treatment works. So we have three wastewater treatment works uh, in the city. And what we'll do is we'll look at concentrations upstream of the wastewater treatment works, downstream of the wastewater treatment works, uh, and then as the river flows through the city uh, and away. And what that allows us to do then is begin to get, get an understanding of what's causing the concentrations in the river. 
and how those concentrations change over space and time. This is how we do the sampling. So um, basically what we'll do is we will go out to a bridge uh, with our sampling kit, uh, dangle a bucket over the bridge, we'll take the sample. That sample will then be filtered uh, on the bridge, you put on ice, and then it'll be taken to the laboratory where we'll analyze it. And we'll analyze it using a technique called liquid chromatography metrometry. So this technique is a very sensitive technique. It's a very specific technique. So it allows us to detect concentrations of pharmaceuticals at very low concentrations. And what we'll do is we'll try and measure a whole range of different pharmaceuticals in those water samples. So we'll look at things like analgesics, asthma treatments, antibiotics. Um, some of the work we've been doing recently, we're looking for antimalarials, antidepressants, beta blockers, and diuretics. Now in the next few slides, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what we find in York. So we do detect pharmaceuticals uh, in the rivers in York. So these are high level data for the river ooze. What we have here uh, uh, is we have um, the mead concentrations that we see in the river ooze at the different sampling locations. Uh, and we also have the maximum concentrations, which are the green bars. The most common pharmaceuticals we detect in the water, the most common we see is a molecule called metformin. So metformin is one of the main type two diabetes treatments in the UK. The second most commonly detected drug is a molecule called gabapentin. So gabapentin is used for epilepsy treatment and also to treat nerve pain. And then the third compound is a molecule called fexofenadine, which is an antihistamine that's used as an, an, as a, a allergy treatment. And you can see that the maximum concentrations that we see in the river ooze are around 3,000 nanograms per liter. So the river ooze uh, is the bigger of our two rivers. So these are the data for the river foss. The river foss is a little bit smaller. Uh, and the first thing that you can see from this is that the concentrations of the pharmaceuticals that we see in the FOSS are higher than we detect in the ooze. And this is primarily down to differences in flow of the different rivers. We also see that the three most common pharmaceuticals or highly detected pharmaceuticals in the ooze are also the ones that we detect in the FOSS. So again, we're seeing metformin at the highest concentrations followed by gabapentin and the, then the fexofenadine. Now, if like me, you struggle to put these sort of concentrations, which are in nanograms per liter into some perspective, um, what I try and do is I try and think about it in terms of pills and swimming pools. So what I'm gonna do in the next slide is just put that concentration, maximum concentration uh, of metformin into a little bit of a, a more understandable unit. Uh, and basically what that corresponds to is a situation where we take a blister pack of metformin. So you've got a blister pack there of about 20 metformin pills. Uh, and then we dissolve that in an Olympic size swimming pool, which you can see there. And that would pretty much give us the concentration of metformin that we see uh, in the River Foss uh, in, in the UK and York. So these concentrations are quite low. I mean, that's quite a big dilution. So why should we worry about that? Well, the reason we as scientists are concerned about pharmaceuticals in the environment is that they are biologically active molecules. So if you think of a pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical is designed to interact with either a receptor or a target in the human. Um, so here's just a very simple diagram. You have uh, so the jigsaw, so you've got one part of the jigsaw is the receptor. So this is the receptor in the human body. body. We then absorb the drug. The drug interacts with the receptor. So you can see it's fitting nicely uh, into the receptor there. And then that results in the therapeutic effect and hopefully cures our illness. The problem is many of those receptors also occur in organisms in the environment. So if we look at things like fish and also invertebrates and sometimes algae and plants, we find that many of the receptors that pharmaceuticals target in humans occur in organisms in the environment. So if we're releasing these molecules to the environment, 
they're being accumulated by organisms in the environment, it's likely that they could have some effect on those organisms. And we've done a little bit of work over the years to try and understand what the types of effects of pharmaceuticals are on aquatic and terrestrial organisms. I'm just going to give you a few uh, examples. So the first um, is ibuprofen. Um, so ibuprofen is a very commonly used drug in the UK. You can buy it over the counter. And the concentrations of ibuprofen that we see in rivers in the laboratory have been shown to affect the hatching of fish. So it's possible that the presence of ibuprofen in UK rivers will be affecting fish populations. The second example there is diclofenac, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a moment. So diclofenac is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Again, in the UK, we can buy it over the counter. The concentrations of diclofenac that we see in rivers in the laboratory have been shown to affect the uh, cellular structure uh, of fish livers. So it affects the fish histology. Moving to a terrestrial example, um, a few years ago, we had a PhD student looking at antidepressants. Um, and uh, what the student did was look at exposure of birds to antidepressants in wastewater treatment works. So the exposure route here is basically we've got the uh, antidepressant going into the wastewater treatment work, the trickling filter works that I showed you earlier. Uh, if you go to these works, you find that those systems have very high numbers of things like worms and insects. And quite often what you find is that there's a very healthy or, or sort of big bird population around these works because basically they're using the works uh, as a food resource. It's like their local McDonald's. So what we did in these studies is we looked at the movement of the antidepressant into the worms, into the birds, and then we looked at the effect on bird behavior. And we found that the types of concentrations of antidepressants that we see in wastewater treatment works might be expected to affect the feeding behavior uh, of starlings. And again, that could be very important in terms of the health of the starling population living around these treatment works. Now, the final example I want to give you in terms of the UK impacts are the antimicrobials or the antibiotics. If you compare the concentrations of antibiotics we see in UK rivers, quite often you find that they're higher than those that are known to affect things like algae. So we expect that the presence of antibiotics in the aquatic system in the UK could be affecting primary producers in rivers. But I think more importantly, quite often what we find is that levels of pharmaceuticals in rivers are higher than levels that are thought to select for a for resistance in bacteria. And the concern here is if that resistance gets back into humans uh, and also into animals, it could be contributing to the global antimicrobial resistance crisis. So hopefully I've shown you that in the UK, we do, do detect pharmaceuticals in the environment. And quite often we see concentrations of pharmaceuticals in the environment where we might expect effects on ecosystem health and probably also human health. But in the rest of the talk, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more broadly and talk about levels globally. This paper came out in 2016, uh, and basically what it did was it reviewed everything we knew about the levels of pharmaceutical pollution in rivers around the world. So what they did was they did a big analysis of the published literature to look at where pharmaceuticals have been monitored, what concentrations of pharmaceuticals have been monitored, and how many pharmaceuticals have been monitored. This slide sums the results up. Uh, and the first thing to show is the gray areas. So the gray countries are countries where basically there's been no monitoring at all. So you can see that in certain areas of Latin America, Africa, and also Asia, we have simply no data on the levels of pharmaceutical contamination. You can also see that we have some countries colored either orange or yellow. In these countries, people have only looked for somewhere between one to 10 pharmaceuticals. And quite often that monitoring might have been done at only a handful of sites. So thinking globally, we know very little about 
the level of pharmaceutical pollution. Why is that important? Well, I think one concern is that in many countries of the world, we might expect that levels of pharmaceutical pollution could be higher than the types of levels that you might expect in countries like the UK or the US. This study came out in 2007. It was a study performed by a Swedish group. Uh, and what they did was they went to an area uh, around Hyderabad, where there was a, a lot of drug manufacturing, and they looked at concentrations of a range of substances, primarily antibiotics, in the rivers. Um, this concentration here was the scariest result that they showed. And they, in that study, what they reported was a concentration of 31 milligrams per litre. So that's about 10,000 times higher than the concentration we see for metformin in a York rivers. So 31 milligrams per litre in rivers in India. And to put that concentration into some perspective, ciprofloxacin is an antibiotic. If your doctor prescribed you ciprofloxacin and I came and took a sample of your blood and I measured the concentration of ciprofloxacin in your blood, it would be about 10 times lower than the concentration that they were detecting in the river water, which is quite concerning. There's also a very good example from uh, other regions of the world where pharmaceuticals have had a real impact on ecology. Uh, and here I'd like to just briefly talk about that example, and it's the story of the diclofenac and the vultures. Going back to the 1980s, in certain Indi areas of India and Pakistan, um, there was about 40 million vultures uh, in that region. But over a period of about 20 years, so moving to the late 90s, what was seen was that the population numbers massively declined. So by the late 1990s, the numbers had dropped to 6,000 birds. So this was a, a very, very, very rapid decline in the number of vultures in those areas. At the time, what was done was a lot of work to try and understand what was causing it. A lot of forensic work was done. And the final conclusion was that the decline of the vulture populations was down to the use of the molecule diclofenac, this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And what was causing it was that the local population were using diclofenac to treat lameness in their cattle. When the cattle were dying, the vultures were coming in, they were gob gobbling away at the carcasses, accumulating the diclofenac. And due to biochemical differences between the vulture and the human, they were very sensitive to exposure to the molecule. And it caused something called visceral gout. And that gout then ultimately killed the birds and resulted in this large population decline. Now, fortunately, that was spotted. Diclofenac has now been banned for use in cattle in those regions. And there's efforts ongoing at the moment to reintroduce young birds into the areas to try and revive the populations. But I think both of these examples illustrate the importance of looking at pharmaceutical pollution globally. So what we've been doing over the past three years is a global monitoring project. In the project, what we've been doing is we've been working with collaborators from 104 countries. We've been monitoring 134 different river systems. We've been looking at a number of sites at each of those river systems. And in the samples obtained from those sites, we've been analyzing 61 pharmaceuticals. The way we've done it uh, is we've basically worked with the collaborators. We've sent these collaborators uh, these kits here. So these are boxes that fit in your hand. They contain all the vials. They contain a bucket uh, and the filtration equipment. And what, will, what the collaborator will do is they will go out to their local river system. They'll take samples of water along the river system. They'll then free them, ship them back to York where we do the analysis. This is what a typically, typical sampling campaign would look like. So this is a campaign that was done in Israel, looking at the concentrations of pharmaceuticals along the Nablus River and the Alexander River. So in this particular system, what you have is the Nablus River passing over from Palestine into Israel. It then joins the Alexander River and then moves down to the Mediterranean Sea. 
Each of those red points is a sampling point. So what our collaborator did was went go to each of those points. They took a sample of the water, then froze it and took it back to York for analysis. I've just got a few pictures of some of the sampling. So uh, these are some samples being taken in Tübingen in Germany. So this is our collaborator Sven uh, taking a sample from a bridge uh, and filtering the sample. Uh, this is uh, one of our MSc students working in Israel sampling the Alexander River. Uh, you can see here that this is a very, very low flow river. So Elaine here is crouching in the middle of the river, taking a sample from the middle of the river. This is uh, some sampling being done in Nairobi. So this is a tributary of the Nairobi River that passes through the University of Nairobi campus. And some of our collaborators were really innovative. So this is a sample being taken in Nur Sultan in Kazakhstan. Uh, you can see here that this is a, a fairly high bridge. Uh, so our collaborators in Nur Sultan uh, got their fishing rod out, uh, attached our bucket to the fishing rod, dangled it over the bridge, uh, and then got their sample using the fishing rod. So there were some quite innovative uh, approaches to the sampling. So I'd just like to give you a little bit of a flavor for what was found. The first thing I want to do is just show you a map of the total concentrations that we see by country. So what we've done here is we've basically added up uh, all of the concentrations we see in the different samples obtained for each country. Uh, and we've then come up with a, a mean concentration. Uh, and then we have just colored the country based on that mean concentration. And you can see straight away from this, the, the countries that we have tended to monitor most, so countries in Europe, in North America, tend to have the lowest concentrations, where countries that have not had as much monitoring in the past, so countries in Latin America, Africa, uh, and Asia, the areas where we see highest concentrations. In terms of the top 25 most contaminated systems, uh, these are shown here. So again, what we have here is we have the total concentration of pharmaceutical per system. You have the different campaign along the x-axis there. Uh, and you can see that primarily these most contaminated systems uh, are located again in Latin America, in Africa and Asia. Although you can see that bar there. So um, that's the most contaminated European site. So this was uh, the river going through Madrid uh, in Spain. We think the reason for this high concentration is due to the high population density in Madrid and the fact that this is quite a low flow river. This is the most contaminated US river that we monitored. So this is uh, a river uh, in Dallas. And then the third on the, the third point on the far right was a Scottish river. So that was the most contaminated UK river. This slide looks at the top 25 active ingredients that we detect. So of the 61 pharmaceuticals that we monitored, we detected 52 of them across the whole study. And the most frequently detected molecule was paracetamol, was the, con the molecule that we saw at the highest concentrations. The second highest concentrations we saw for caffeine, um, now that's probably not due to pharmaceutical use, but uh, um, more down to uh, drinking a coffee and tea. Um, but again, I think I think it's quite quite interesting that the concentrations of paracetamol actually exceed caffeine, which you know people like you and I probably consume daily. And then the third highest concentration that we see globally is metformin. So that's the concentrate. That's the the molecule that we saw at greatest concentrations in the York study. And we do find that pretty much everywhere in the global monitoring. So I think what we're seeing from this study then is that regions that have received less monitoring in, in the past are the ones where we see the highest concentrations. And we also see many more pharmaceuticals in many of these regions than we would in a river, say, in the UK. So what's the implications of these concentrations then for ecological health and human health? 
Well, this slide is a little bit busy. So this is the most complicated slide in the talk, but um, I'll briefly talk you through it. So what we've done here is we've basically derived what we think are safe concentrations of different pharmaceuticals in the environment. We derived two types of safe concentration. The first is safe for ecology, and the second is safe in terms of antimicrobial resistance selection. So the orange bars correspond to ecological effects, and the blue bars correspond to antimicrobial resistance selection. On the x-axis, on the on the y on, on the x-axis, we have the proportion of sites by continent exceeding the safe concentration. And then on the y-axis, we have the different pharmaceuticals that exceed the safe concentration. So if we Africa, for example, that bar there, uh, that's for sulfamethoxazole, which is an antimicrobial compound. What we find in Africa is 30% of the sites that we monitored have concentrations of sulfamethoxazole above a value that we would be considering safe in terms of ecological effects. So that was the most um, or the highest percentage of all the continents in terms of ecological risk. If we look at this bar here, this is ciprofloxacin, which again is an antimicrobial. So in Asia, almost 50% of the sites we visited had concentrations of ciprofloxacin above the concentration that we think is safe in terms of antimicrobial resistance selection. And that's really important because resistance is now regarded as basically a global health disaster. At the moment, we think it's killing around 700,000 people a year across the globe. And it's predicted that that number is going to increase to 10 million by 2050. And we're beginning to recognize that the presence of antibiotics in the environment could be contributing to this problem. That analysis was done on single pharmaceuticals. It's also important to recognize that in a sample, we don't just detect one pharmaceutical, we detect mixtures of pharmaceuticals. So what I've got in this slide here um, is basically a, a, an analysis of the number of pharmaceuticals that we detect in different campaigns. And if you look at the bar on the right, you can see that there are some campaigns, Europe um, and also Asia, where in one sample, we detect up to 35 pharmaceuticals in that sample. That then raises the issue that these molecules could be working together to enhance the effects. And this is something that we're just starting work on. So we're starting to look at what the potential effects of these mixtures of pharmaceuticals might be on ecological health. We've only just started this, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor for some of the initial data that we're going to, we've generated. Um, what we've been doing is we've been effectively making up the mixtures that we see in the global study. We've been making up them up in the laboratory, and then we've been using those mixtures to assess toxicity to plants and also invertebrates. In the plant studies, we find that many of these mixtures affect the plant growth. So they affect the biomass of plants, they affect leaf development and also length. The invertebrate studies show that some of these mixtures, if you expose invertebrates to these mixtures, basically will just kill the invertebrates. So if these impacts that we see in the laboratory are happening in the field, that means that these mixtures could be having quite big impa impacts on the ecology uh, of these river systems. So what's driving it then? Well, in the monitoring study, our collaborators, when they went out to these sites, not only took the samples, but they also took lots of notes. So they took notes on what was going on around each of the sites that were monitored. What we've done is we've taken that information, that qualitative information, to try and look at what types of land use and other practices are associated with highest levels of pollution that we see in the, around the globe. 
And just an overview of that analysis is shown here. Um, you can see a, this sort of word cloud here that sort of illustrates some of the, the terms that are associated with the most polluted sites. So we have things like waste, hospital, septic, exhauster, farming, rubbish, sewage. So I think you can begin to get a feel from that what some of the causes of these high levels of pollution are. Then on the right, we've just got a few examples uh, of specific uh, drivers of pollution that we see uh, in different campaigns that we performed. So in the next few slides, what I'd like to do is just give you a few pictures to illustrate some of this. So this slide then was one of the most polluted sites we saw in terms of antibiotics. At this site, we measured very high concentrations of this molecule, metronidazole, which is an antibiotic. It was 300 times higher than the concentration that we think is safe in terms of resistance selection. And when we looked at the information from the sampling team on the characteristics of this site, what we found is that it was next to an industrial facility. So just behind the houses background is a pharmaceutical manufacturing area. And we think that the very high concentrations that we're seeing of metronidazole here are being driven by the pharmaceutical manufacturing. This is one of the most contaminated sites in Kenya. So this is in Nairobi. Uh, and you can see in the top right there, there's basically a pipe coming into the river system. Uh, and you can see solid material coming out of that pipe. That pipe is basically discharging untreated sewage directly into the river. This is also in Nairobi. Uh, this is taken um, from another location in Nairobi. Uh, the location of the river is shown at the top there, which actually looks quite rural. But in the river, we found very, very high concentrations of pharmaceuticals. When we went to Google Street View and we looked at the notes from the sampling team, what we saw is that the notes from the team said that there was exhaustor lorry activity. And going to Google, we went a little bit away from the river up the road. Uh, and this is a picture that we see. Um, and if you pan round using Google Street View, you see even more of these tankers. So these are exhaustor tankers. And these tankers basically go around Nairobi, emptying the septic tanks. And what seems to be happening is that they, they then drive to this location and they discharge that waste directly into the river, thus enhancing the pharmaceutical concentrations. This was a contaminated site or a very highly contaminated site that we saw in Accra in Ghana. This was a site that was adjacent to a waste dump. So this dump has received quite a lot of uh, press coverage in the UK because it's one of the dumps where Europe and the UK, and I think also the US, is illegally exporting waste to, to the dump. It's primarily an e-waste dump, but again, our suspicion here is that probably not just e-waste is going out to these dumps, but also medical waste. Uh, and that medical waste is then transporting from the dump out into the water system. And you can see an informal settlement in the background that will be using that, that water um, for their day-to-day -day lives. So that there you've got a, a potential uh, direct exposure almost to the pharmaceutical pollution uh, in the river. And then in Nairobi again, we saw areas where there was just general littering. So this was just a picture of the stream bank of one of the sites where we see very high concentrations. And our suspicion here is that in that waste, again, there's probably unused pharmaceuticals just mingling and leaching out into the river. And the final picture I want to show you um, is the site in Israel. So this is the site on the Nablus River. Uh, this is the river as it passes from the West Bank into Israel. And in that water, we find very, very high concentrations of pharmaceuticals. And the reason for that is just over the side, other side of the wall, there's a, a city. So it's a Palestinian city. And that city is discharging untreated sewage directly into the Nablus River. It's then passing over the border into Israel and then moving down through the river to the Mediterranean Sea. 
And you can see from this, this is a very low flow river, so you hardly get any dilution of that wastewater. So just to begin to bring things to a close then, hopefully I've convinced you that the pharmaceuticals that we use will end up in the environment. Levels of pharmaceuticals in rivers across the world are likely having impacts on the ecology of rivers. And I think they also pose a threat to human health, particularly through the selection of antimicrobial resistance. The most impacted sites are typically found in lower middle income countries. So areas where we have poor waste and wastewater management, industrial manufacturing and industrial discharges, but also areas with water scarcity. But it's not just those countries that are impacted. I showed at the start that even levels that we see in the UK are levels that we should be concerned about. And I think this is a tough problem to deal with, but we need global collaboration to solve it. But this is Earth Day, so I just want to close with what we as individuals could do. And I want to go back to my back of the envelope calculation. And you'll remember from that calculation that just under 3,000 tonnes of pharmaceuticals aren't used. Now, in the UK, about 84% of that 3,000 tonnes is just thrown away in the trash or flushed down the toilet. Only 16% of it will be taken back to the pharmacist, which is what we should be doing in the UK. So if you get anything from this talk, what I'd like to encourage you to do is if you have unused medicines, is to dispose of it correctly. Um, in preparing the talk, I did a little bit of background research to look at how the system works uh, in Minnesota. Um, I found out that actually you do have take back schemes. Um, and if you go to some of the guidance, what it says is whenever possible, take your unused prescription drugs to a collection program or event. And many of these events and collection programs are run by pharmacies, police and sheriff departments who have secure collection receptacles and they will dispose of it properly and safely. Uh, and you can see the map there showing the distribution uh, of where you can take your unused drugs back. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you want more uh, information on the global monitoring study, uh, we do have a website. So it's www.globalfarms.org. As the data become available, our plan is to upload all of the data onto the site so that people can access it and use it. Um, so watch that space. The data should be coming up fairly soon. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today um, and listening to what I have to say. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to discussion and the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair, for an excellent presentation that was fascinating. Disturbing, but fascinating. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions and um, from the audience, and I would encourage the audience to keep adding your questions to the chat. We will get to them. Uh, but first, I want to introduce our other two panelists who will be joining us for the discussion. Uh, first, Ava Carlson, who is the co-founder and director of University Relations at Roundtable RX which is Minnesota's medication repository. And she helps coordinate volunteer efforts and operations at the state's only medication repository program, which aims to reduce medication waste and improve access to life-saving medications. Uh, our other panelist, Mark Ferry, is an environmental scientist at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Before coming to the MPCA, he studied nitrogen fixation in soybeans at the University of Minnesota before turning to the biodegradation of pesticides and other contaminants in soil. Mark is currently studying pharmaceuticals and endocrine active subchemicals in Minnesota's lakes and rivers with recent investigations focused on disinfection byproducts in our surface waters. I wonder, Eva, first and then Mark, if you could each say a little bit more about your work and then we'll take some questions and, and get our discussion underway. Thing. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, 
I can talk a little bit more about our program right off the bat. Uh, so we at Roundtable Rx primarily work with nursing homes um, to reduce uh, medication waste. So many times a, a prescription is prescribed for a patient uh, and they end up not needing it for a variety of different reasons. Um, and I've heard um, you know, from colleagues that a lot of times these medications just end up getting flushed down the drains. And so we wanted to address not only that problem, but also um, try to reach patients who are struggling to afford medications. Um, so it seemed to go hand in hand and um, the program is working pretty well so far. Um, but today I'm hoping to I can provide a little bit more information too about household disposal um, and use my pharmacy background to try to answer some of your questions as well. Great, thank you, Mark. Yeah, hi, Valerie. We've been uh, studying pharmaceuticals and uh, other chemicals of emerging concern as we've called them. For a number of years now in Minnesota, probably for the last 10 years, um, and funding that we've received, generous funding through the Clean Water Funding, um, actually has allowed us to expand that um, monitoring of pharmaceuticals in the environment um, to large randomized uh, location studies across Minnesota, where we're able to, to look for these contaminants not only where we might really expect them, like downstream of wastewater treatment plants, but also in really remote regions of the state as well. Um, and so that's been really enlightening. Um, one of the studies that we recently finished up uh, was a study that we did with collaborators at the Grand Portage Band of Chippewa and the University of Minnesota um, researchers that showed that we're detecting these pharmaceuticals very, very readily, even in remote locations of the Grand Portage Indian Reservation, which is in a far northeastern location of the state. And, and we also detect them in fish. So um, these, these contaminants are kind of a footprint of our society we're finding, um, that, that we're finding really all over the place. Okay, great, thank you. Well, as we, we've got questions that are, are coming in from the chat and being accumulated, uh, let me just sort of get us warmed up here. Um, Alistair, I was intrigued by your, um, the data from York, and you found that metformin was the most common uh, pharmaceutical in the rivers, and much more so even than something like ibuprofen, which is kind of intriguing yep. because I would just think the usage of ibuprofen was much more common. What explains? Yeah. That? So, <clears throat> yeah. So what what you find is so usage is is a, an important driver of concentration, um, but also the amount that's removed in wastewater treatment is important. So something like ibuprofen we find is um, over ninety nine percent removed by a typical wastewater treatment works. Okay. So even though we use, it, it's the most widely used um, alongside paracetamol, um, we find that concentrations in the river actually are lower because you get the wastewater water removal. Metformin is actually very different to treat. Um, and I didn't show the data, but we've also done some analysis of drinking water um, in York for metformin. Um, and we the concentrations of metformin in drinking water almost the same as in the river, um, which is showing that the drinking water treatment basically isn't able to re to remove the metformin due to the the properties of the molecule. Um, so it so it's a combination of yeah, treatability and usage uh, or what drive what we see in the river. Okay, okay, that's good. That's very helpful. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna start going with some questions from the, the audience. Uh, we've got one here that's talking about diclofenac is now approved in European countries, including Spain, despite the dramatic Indian subcontinent example that you talked about. Uh, last week, they found the first vulture dead due to diclofenac residues, which is concerning. Uh, what could be done to regulate this compound? Yeah, yeah. So that that's just hit the news. Um, I think I think the in newspaper in the UK had an article on it on it last week. Um, now the the regulator uh, in Europe, the European Medicines Agency, um, have have done a some modelling of diclofenac in Spain and the vulture exposure. 
happen. And they predicted um, that the exposure would, would be quite low. But this data suggests that that's not the case. Um, and I don't think anyone's really clear as to what's going on, um, whether it's due to you know, normal practice of using diclofenac or whether it's due to some, some sort of bad practice that's going on in the area. Um, because the assessment that the medicines agency did, even based on the data from Pakistan and India, was that the exposure you get from the use uh, in Spain would, wouldn't wouldn't be high enough for the vultures. Hmm. Okay, all right. Thank so you. it's yeah, it's a bit of it's a it's a. I was talking to someone last week actually about it. You know what what's driving it? We don't we don't really know. Huh. Okay. Um, so um, let me ask you, and then I want our other our panelists to weigh in. You mentioned that uh, wastewater treatment is obviously one way that we can do some of these things getting into the environment and and you showed the examples from parts of the world where there's no or very limited wastewater treatment um, but obviously as, as we saw with uh, metformin wastewater treatment doesn't get rid of everything and yeah. it's also if you don't have it it's extremely expensive to put in and so some of these countries the with, uh, with the dramatic pictures you showed would probably not have the financial resources to put in effective uh, wastewater treatment. So what else, what are some other solutions that we yeah. can be using? And they may vary in different parts of the world as well. So if you think- Yeah, so that's a- <clears throat> Go ahead. That's, so that's a really interesting um, question. So um, if, if you think back to the photo of um, the, the Palestine-Israel uh, river, um, yeah, this, this illustrates the problem that we're facing. So um, we visited that site um, and, the, and apparently, historically, uh, the German government invested a lot of development money into the city in Palestine uh, to build a wastewater treatment plant to clean up the river. Um, that was done uh, and it, it, it did the job. Um, it, it sort of cleaned up the river, but it survived about a year so as soon as the german government moved out uh, it wasn't maintained uh, apparent stuff was stolen uh, and they're back to square run square one um and the more i i, I get into this the more I, I realize that what we can't do is use the fixes that we use in the uk europe us in those types of situations what what we need is you know, low cost, low maintenance solutions, which perhaps might not be as good. Um, and there's quite a lot of, I've, I've, since we've been doing this, I, I've been contacted by a lot of people who work on sort of more nature-based treatment systems, which are more localized. So you could possibly in, incorporate them into informed assessments. And that okay. then would you know, have, a, have a big effect on the pharmaceutical levels in the rivers, but it would also improve the uh, microbial contamination of the rivers and all the other chemicals. So I think it, you know, generally it would have a, a, a massive, a massive positive effect. Yep. Um, great, um, great. Thank you. Eva, you want to weigh you. in on that one? What other than sewage treatment can we be doing to address this problem? Yeah, with my perspective, of course, I'm thinking about prevention um, in the first place, of course. So, um, you know, we're not, it's not to say stop taking your pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, your doctors prescribe these for a reason, but thinking about, um, I think Alistair mentioned that the pharmacy um, from, or medications going back to the pharmacist. Um, one thing I would consider with, you know, especially with pain medications, post-surgery or um, kind of those as needed situations, you can think about waiting until you do need the medication in order to pick it up in the first place. That way it's not sitting around at home um, being not used or, um, you know, so thinking about when do I really need it? What do I really need? And when I'm done with it, what can I do with it properly? Great, thank you. Mark, you wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, just briefly. Um, the disposal locations that Dr. Boxel talked about just briefly, did this homework on Minnesota's disposal locations. They've been really successful here. Um, I think the figure is uh, 480 of these locations are available in Minnesota, and they've already collected about a million pounds of pharmaceutical waste over since 2007. So that's that's been a, a real successful um, 
program in intercepting that pharmaceutical waste from reaching our environment. The other thing I'd really like to tell people is, is this, uh, you know, what we put down our drain matters. If people, not only just in pharmaceutical waste, right, but um, other things too, if we're a little more conscientious about what we're putting down the drain, it can make a difference because people have this misconception that wastewater treatment plants treat our wastewater, right? I mean, they take everything out but they're not designed to take these chemicals out at these kind of concentrations. And so they tend to flow through at least 50% of what we're putting down the drain in terms of pharmaceuticals tend to flow through into the river or lake um, in terms of effluent. So if we can think a little bit more uh, proactively in terms of what goes down the drain, that helps. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, we've got a question here about whether the ecologically safe levels for these pharmaceuticals are published somewhere out and available in the literature. <laughs> so the, <clears throat> yeah, so um, the antimicrobial resistance ones are published. So um, they're, they're um, yeah, that there's, you know, I, I can send, send the details to fresh water and uh, that could be circulated um we're just we're just putting together the paper the risk paper so they will be published um so, yeah so okay. but then they're, they're not out there yet the ones that we used okay great mark you looked like you had an, a response to that one yeah just just real quickly you know whenever i speak to people about this people have this conception in their mind that a part per trillion or a part per billion how could that possibly be causing a problem anywhere? You know, what we need to keep in mind is that what we're talking about is, it depends on how the point of departure that we, in, in our risk assessment, Heiko Schoenfuss, a, a colleague of mine at the St. Cloud State University here, he did this great calculation. He said, look, if, if fish in a river that has just a few parts per billion of a pharmaceutical, if, if they're living in that river, they're breathing about five therapeutic doses a day of that chemical. Mm. And that, that's something we have to keep in mind about concentration seeming really low versus what might, what the effect might be, you know, and Dr. Boxel's um, example of the vulture um, debacle, you know, the disaster is another really good example something that we don't even think about in terms of concentration or affecting us can have huge effect if we're not careful. Great, thank you. Um, so somebody wants to know if it's possible to retrofit old wastewater treatment plants with testing equipment and or pollution reduction equipment um, to upgrade them to get rid of more of these more newer chemicals. Yeah. Yep, so it, that, that's definitely possible, uh, and it's being considered in Europe. It's actually being done in Switzerland. Um, the, the problem is it's very expensive. So in the UK, we've we've been thinking of doing it, um, and and they did a an economic analysis of what it would cost, um, and it comes to I think about it would be about thirty five billion uh, US dollars over ten years to upgrade uh, UK treatment plants to, to get these things down to a safe level. So it's doable, but it's very costly. What it wouldn't do, uh, there are molecules like metformin, which probably wouldn't be treatable. So, uh, but some of the ones that we know are of, of a concern could be, could be treatable, but it, it costs money. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it also makes me think of the fact that in some of these areas where that you showed in, in Africa and Asia where there's no wastewater treatment, hence there are lots of pharmaceuticals. We know there are gonna be lots of, you know, heavy metals and pesticides and polycyclic yeah. aromatic hydrocarbons and all that stuff. And yet these are also areas where people are often reliant on subsist subsistence fisheries for yeah. consuming enough protein. I mean, that's, yeah. what do you do about that, you know? Yeah, and so the, the exhauster photo I showed you, I, I gave a talk where um, someone in the audience actually um, was from Nigeria 
um, and Lagos. Um, and, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, exactly the same thing happens in Lagos. Uh, and those exhausters are basically pouring their waste into Lagos Lagoon, which is the main fish supply for the local population. So, you know, it, it, it's up, you know, it, 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 it's crazy. Um, yeah, you know, that could be something that could be fixed. And actually, you know, that material could, with a bit of thought, could be used as a resource. Yeah. To produce energy, for example. Yep, yep. Other, any of our panelists want to comment on that? No. Okay, we'll move to... <laughs> Go ahead, Eva. <laughs> okay. I'm just looking here. I'm getting a message that we are supposed to be ending, I think, now. I thought we had some additional time, um, but I think our, our hour is up. So I would like to, on this um, Earth Day, I wondered if all of you... We talked about some solutions. Alistair, you closed your um, presentation with some suggestions about other ways that we as individuals can make a difference and help. And I'm wondering if all of you have some, just a closing uh, sentence or two, either on how we as individuals or as groups um, can help make a difference into this, in, in this, um, issue. And let me start with Mark, and then I'll go to Eva and, and give Alistair the last word. So. Okay, yeah, quick, quick remark. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to participate in this. This has been great. And thanks for the great talk, uh, Alistair. That was really, really interesting. You know, I, I think this really does go to Ava's um, work and the really great work that she and others have been doing in getting the program off the ground to take back uh, pharmaceuticals and repurpose them. That has been a, a really good effort. The, the closing remark I think I would make is, is this. We ignore these chemicals in our environment at our own peril, really. Um, we like to think that we identified all of the hazardous contaminants in our environment back in the 70s, and it just isn't so. You know, we have better instrumentation now that shows that, well, okay, we have these contaminants in our water, in our environment, and, and in our air, by the way, and in precipitation. Um, but we should, we should really not be ignoring those. I think just a greater consciousness, really, in addition to saying, you know, what we put down our drain matters, a greater consciousness of what it is that we're doing, you know, how we're interacting with our environment, uh, what we're putting into our environment can go a long way is because you know, we've shown that we've been able to make a difference in that way before, whether it's everything from recycling to hazardous waste collection. I think this is another example of how we have to be cognizant of what we're doing and, and um, uh, making sure that those contaminants don't reach our, our environment, you know. Good message. Good message. Ava? Yeah, thank you, Mark. And thanks, Alistair, too. Um, I would echo it what Mark had said, being conscious of not only where things are going, but where they're coming from, what we're taking in to our homes as well, um, as I mentioned before, and kind of thinking more about uh, what, what is it we really need and where can we uh, dispose of it that makes the most sense. Um, and so one thing to do to take it the extra step is not only dispose of your own medications properly, but if you can get a neighborhood roundup or a family roundup, um, I get people together. I think someone mentioned in the chat that DEA uh, take back day is coming up this weekend. So great time to do that. Excellent. Good suggestion. Thank you. And Alistair, you get the last word. Yeah, well, I, I guess you know, I'd already talked about the take back. So I back up what, what Ava and, and Mark said. But I think that the, the, the thing I would add is I think we should all be lobbying you know, the decision makers. Um, I don't. I don't think those the situations that we see in you know, some of those really impacted country acceptable. Um, if you look at the industry, uh, the manufacturing, a lot of the drugs that you and I use are actually coming from these countries. Um, so we, you know, we're polluting 
the countries that we're sourcing our drugs from. Um, I think we should be lobbying you know, our, our health providers um, to you know, get them to fix their supply chains and actually you know, stop this happening. Great, good suggestion. Well, that concludes our program for today. Um, thank you so much, Alistair, for a fantastic a talk. Thank you, Ava and Mark, for being great panelists and to all of you viewing us online uh, for your participation today. We are gonna make this lecture available to stream anytime from the Freshwater website and we'll let, mail out a link in the next couple of days. And I'll encourage you to visit freshwater.org to join our mailing list and stay in the loop on upcoming speakers and additional ways that you can make a difference for water. And in the meantime, enjoy Earth Day. So thank you.